E.B. Zaboy is the best-selling author of the young adult novels American Street, a National Book Award finalist, and Pride, a contemporary remix of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. She is the co-author of Punching the Air, written with prison reform activist Dr. Yusuf Salam of The Exonerated Five. Her debut picture book, The People Remember, received a Coretta Scott King Book Honor Award. With her latest novel, Okoye to the People, E.B. joins the Marvel Universe with the story of the iconic Dora Milaje leader as a young warrior. For today's conversation, E.B. is joined by Karima Horn, creator of the blog, The Blurred Girl, and host of the podcasts, The Radical Geeks and The Blurred Girl Podcast. Karima is the author of the forthcoming Protectors of Wakanda, a history and training manual of the Dora Milaje, scheduled for publication in September, 2022. Copies of E.B. Zaboy's books are available from St. Louis indie bookstore, The Novel Neighbor. Pre-order copies of Karima's book now. I'm Kara Mahorn. It's nice. It's such a pleasure to meet you. And I'm really excited about your book. Hello, Karima. Nice to meet you. And thank you for all the work you do with Blurred Girl. I think I've seen it before. There's a uh, several of you, nerd girl, black girl nerd, <laughs> black nerds. Uh, so many spaces that I wish I had many, many, many moons ago. I'm Gen X. So we had we had nerds but we did not always find each other. <laughs> and I yeah. wish there were uh, spaces like that. I wish there was the internet um, so we could find each other and not feel so alone in the world. No, I completely agree. I didn't, the, the spaces didn't exist growing up for me either. And it was just one of those things that I just decided to do when I didn't realize 2018, it all kind of blew up because Black Panther. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so speaking of Black Panther, I would love to hear more about your book, Okoye to the People. So I got this deal or got this contract with Marvel in 2018. So mm -hmm. you know, a year after Black Panther, I was really excited. And of course, Okoye, one of the reasons why I said yes to this project was because I am Haitian and I always knew about the Dahomey phone warriors, the women warriors that colonizers misnamed the Amazon Dahomey warriors, which the Dora Milaje are based on. They were West African women warriors who had to fight during war for several reasons. And there are warriors in uh, indigenous African culture. So I felt a connection to like, yes, I am going to write about this warrior. So over the course of planning for the book, we decided that Okoye would be in her late teens because I write for teens, I write for young adults and children, and it would be before uh, the MCU world, before the movie Black Panther. And Okoye is about 18 or 19, and she is new, she is a new Dora Milaje, and she is tasked with accompanying King Tachaka and Captain Aneka to New York City for the very first time. And this is her first time outside of Wakanda. She ends up in Brooklyn just trying to explore the world uh, the world of New York City. And it's a kind of a, a pushy councilwoman who's trying to get these politicians to come over to this neighborhood called Brownsville because it's, it has, it's having some trouble. And it seems like the rest of the world is getting help except for this neighborhood. So councilwoman um, Lucinda Tate invites King T'Chaka and Okoye to see Brownsville to come to a ribbon cutting ceremony for a new community center. So the kids feel like, uh, the kids in her community feel like they are being seen, that people want to help them. And Okoye meets these teens and she sees that this community needs help, but Wakanda has its hands tied. They are not able to help. And she has this uh, sort of existential crisis about what it means to be a warrior in the world, what it means to be a protector of Wakanda 
but not a protector of the people who look like her and the people of Wakanda in other parts of the world. And I think that's fascinating. One of the things I was going to ask you about is because in the comics, um, everybody, in, including uh, the movies, more people are familiar with T'Challa than T'Chaka, his father. And in the comics, T'Chaka is very clear about not not letting outsiders in and not helping outsiders. Um, there is a point that he has a very serious choice to make in the comics, but so I found it interesting that you started there and not T'Challa, who was all about helping the outside world because it's a it's a very really fascinating dichotomy, and also being black or African in America and having Americans perceive you as something that you're not, like it's the lens of. Um, not just African Americans, but Americans. And I found that also um, really, really fascinating. My book is Protectors of Wakanda, a history and training manual for the Dora Milaje, which is a mouthful. Nice. Um, I didn't <laughs> know that was happening. That's amazing. Yeah. And it I was- I could have used that for the research. <laughs> well, apparently, well, honestly, that was one of the hardest things um, for me because they're and I'm sure you went through this, the history of the Dora Milaje is very disjointed. So you mentioned the Dahomey um, women, but they were also patterned, the first time they showed up was really in a Christopher Priest comic in the eighties. And so he did mention the Dahomey women, but they were really sort of very sexualized looking in the comics when they first appeared. And, but everybody knew they were warriors. But when you look throughout the comics and it really turned into almost a thesis for me, like trying to piece together these puzzles and then thread them together um, into um, the, the the story that I did. So you have a really um, great little passage at the beginning of your book where Okoye is sort of explaining her training and how many years it took and how she's ready to go to America my book is that training it's not just a koye it's all of them and it is um it's a ya novel but it is written in uh, journal form and a koye actually writes the intro and she is a general at this point and it, it t- takes place within the comic book universe after uh the doom wars after uh the intergalactic um, story that ta Coates, basically after ta Coates and Jonathan Hickman's whole run, it takes place there. And it's a tome that when she decides they have to regroup, the Dormelage have to regroup. And she's putting, she's putting out an initiative that they're going to retrain young Dora. They're going to go find young women to become, because they need to, they've, they've lost so many in three of these wars between Namor and everything else. And so it's a found uh um journal that gets passed from dora to dora so as you graduate people mark in it right and then when you graduate you give it to a younger one because the older always take care of the younger mm-hmm. and so but it's all their training and what they eat and what how they sleep and the weapons they use and the outfits and that so my i have stories within those entries um but your story is like this whole um coming of age for Okoye, which I love. And I think the other thing that's amazing about your book is because from, from what I've been able to read is that it's, I, I was really worried. I'm like, oh my God, what if my canon is completely different than her canon? But it's not, it's actually very similar. And I was I was so thrilled to see that. And I'm like, look, Anika's right there. Anika's in my book, you know, but I'm very curious about how you worked with Marvel. Because for me, I had to stick to the canon of the comic books. When you're working on licensed material, it's kind of hard because they give you a fence, but you never kind of know where it is. Yeah. <laughs> so what was the fence for you? Was it the MCU? Was it the movies or was it the comic books? So this was one of the hardest things to, to do to navigate while writing this book. So I, um, I, I know the movie and I know the uh, Roxanne Gay comics as well. And the Shuri comics by Nettie Yakor for and the mm-hmm. Shuri books. I think there was only one out, or there was just coming out um, uh, with by Nick Stone. Yeah, it was actually her first the Shuri book didn't come out um, yet. While I was like working on it on drafting this book, so all I had was uh, those the comics in the movie, but the movie was front front and center because the visuals were there, and I saw it several times. 
So there were so many things I wanted to put in here that I could not put in there because some of those ideas belong to MCU and not necessarily MCU to Ryan Coogler, which is yeah. very interesting because he has a lot of that IP intellectual property from mm -hmm. the movie. So yes, we did come to the decision of having her under uh, King T'Chaka because of a lot of things that we understand that happened in Wakanda and the world had not taken pl place yet. So we can still have her questioning her place in the world because uh, King, uh, you know, Prince T'Challa is still running around Wakanda mm -hmm. pitching marbles or whatever. That's a Caribbean term. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wearing knickers and pitching more. He's still young. Uh, so we needed this to be a coming of age story in that way. I wanted to place Wakanda within the context of Black people in the world um, in the same way that you saw T'Challa and you saw T'Chaka in Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. And it was Oakland, California because of Ryan Coogler. Right. Um, he, that was his choice. That was his experience. And I wanted to bring my experiences into this book. And I grew up in Brooklyn. I lived in Brownsville. I lived in Bushwick. I know Brownsville, East New York. We don't usually get YA novels about these particular communities. And we, we don't. It's like you and Daniel Jose Older. I, I stay getting excited because I live in Brooklyn. I live in Bed-Stuy. And I was like, I know these places. Because I, I can't tell you how many times I have to tell people that like, no, Brownsville is a place. That's an actual place. place not with a, a made up name. <laughs> but a very, very interesting history. And very. if I'm talking about gentrification, I can't erase a little bit of the history. Um, even A Tree Grows in Brooklyn tells a story of a people who are no longer there, right? Mm -hmm. And the poverty of a certain demographic that we don't usually associate with uh, poverty in Brooklyn. So I, and then I wanted to quote that in there and I wanted a tree that I, I called one of the characters tree. Um, yes. The other one, Mars and Mars being a planet of war. So all of these little nuggets, these breadcrumbs I put in there, hoping that readers will find them. Um, what I'm having a challenge with is that I feel like shouting it out onto the internet, but it's so exhausting. It was work to put it into the book. And then you feel like you have to do extra work by letting people know, like, there are breadcrumbs in this book. <laughs> there, if yeah. you're from Brownsville, you're here. so it's, it is such a tough place to be in when you're an author and you want to let people know all the goodies that you put in there via social media. I could do a whole thread explaining the book, right? You could listen, oh, you need to get over to TikTok. Book talk is strong. Book talk would love your book. <laughs> uh, hmm. I'm okay. telling you, we, we'll talk after, but TikTok, listen, because there <laughs> there's a lot of people over there that are like, where are the books? Where are the Black authors? And I'm like, there's a lot, but y'all don't want to go over to Twitter, but okay, there's a lot. <laughs> and it makes me feel better to hear you say that the licensed material thing was kind of uh, not frustrating, but challenging because this is my first full length book. I've, I've written entries in other books and short stories and stuff like that, but I haven't written a full, like this is terrifying. So, um, and I was, I found that challenging too. I think the thing that I was lucky about, uh, from, from my book was that because there were so many holes in the history, mm -hmm. all I had to do was figure out what was Canon. And then they couldn't prove what I was writing. Was it? Cause I was connecting you know, mm -hmm. the dots, like for instance, in the comics, there's 17 Black Panthers and two of them are women. And oh, wow. very, very few people know that, but <laughs> I was able to explore that and which made me like, there's a, and one of the women was created by Nettie Okorfor in that book that you were just talking about. Wow. So wow. it's just one of those things where there's all this trivia and all this lore. And I, 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 finding it fascinating being an African-American woman writing a story of a fictional history of an African country that was created by two white men. <laughs> so the canon is so very, think, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that can't, you some, right on the nail. Yeah. You hit it right. Uh, sometimes I, there's things that come up and I go, I'm not saying that we can't say that. <laughs> 
you um, you really, really um, said something very important for me. Is, and sometimes I struggled with this book. I'm thinking, yes, this is a fictional, but boy, we could re use a real one, right? Or we can make up one from out of our own imagination. But this is something that young people are latching onto. They're not, you know, they don't know all the, the other fictional warriors, Black girl warriors with all the African-based fantasy books that are out there. Black Panther has more of a critical mass behind it um, versus an individual author making up a fictional character. Um, but I was just thinking as you're saying that, that's a lot of labor. That's a lot of work that we are doing um, with side characters. I don't think when they first showed up in comic books, I don't think those writers thought that they would be the phenomena that they are now, just like no one thought um, Black Panther the movie would be the global phenomenon that it is. So us, uh, us bringing lore into these side characters, these somewhat discarded characters, you connecting those threads and adding more lore and making it make sense and bringing their story to the forefront is incredible labor. You know, <laughs> it, you know, it's funny at one point and it, it was, but it, it was at one point I was like, you know what, if I don't get all detailed, no one's going to know. And I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a writer and was like, that's why they put you on this because they know you can't let this go. And I'm <laughs> like, you know what? That's not fair. So like we we know that you know what color like shoes like Anika's head wrap is on Tuesdays. Like they know that you know this. And I'm like, see? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But it's it's less of, it's not so much about fandom. It's more about like what you were saying earlier. I wish I had this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I get emotional sometimes when I think of my baby niece, mm -hmm. she's going to grow up with both of our books. She's going to think this is how it's always been. Yeah. 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 And that's fantastic. Yes. And I think it is so important for us to create our own to create our, our, our own lore um, and pair it with that. And I, I want people to read this book and read your book and also discover the African based fantasy that is out there as well. Children of Blood and Bone. Absolutely. Um, even Legend Born by Tracy Dion to just not let it be the MCU or the comic book world to expand their reading and understanding of this sort of myth making, this magical myth making that we are doing that benefits us first and foremost. So, you know, but at the same time, we get to play in someone else's, um, you know, <laughs> sandbox. We do. We do. Uh, What's your, what was your favorite sandbox. portion of the sandbox? What was your favorite scene? If it's not too spoilery and you can share it. You know, I actually, in writing this, I'm like, I wish I explored Wakanda more. Um, once you leave Wakanda, it's just like, Oh, that was that was utopia, right? And I take her out of utopia and throw her into a dystopian world where it's uh, you know, it's disenfranchisement, it's you know, is is marginalization, it's poverty, it's violence, it's drugs. And I bring all of that up not for the sake of drama, right? But because I grew up in New York City. I cannot not talk about drugs, drugs and gun violence. I, I always see their way into my novels and people are like, why do you? Cause I don't look like I'm from the, I don't present hood culture in uh, what um, is reflected in people's imaginations, but it's the New York city that I grew up in. It's watching the news because I was a latchkey kid. You, right. um, it's um, being an immigrant. And leaving Haiti, um, which in my four-year-old imagination was utopia and getting thrown. I remember distinctly being a little girl, being in Haiti, playing outside, warm weather, family, friends. And within a few months time, sitting in front of the TV because I couldn't go outside because it's 1980s crack epidemic. <laughs> um, and my mother's afraid mm -hmm. um, and it's cold and the kids are mean to me because I have a funny name. And when I watch TV, I didn't change the channel and the six o'clock news would come on <laughs> and you, you get, you know, just this, the local news was terrifying. Yeah. 
So all of that makes its way into my novels. And hence, this is why you have this world of Brownsville that is sort of dystopian, uh, right? And here you have this superhero who was just like, what happened here? <laughs> yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And that, that kind of first-gen conversation, my mother's from Bermuda mm -hmm. and she said it was such a culture shock coming to New York mm -hmm. um, when this, God, I think around the same time, 60s, 70s, her, her, her parents were here first, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like, and I'm, I'm sure you understand what this means. Her parents came up here, worked as a maid and butler and would send money down. And then she didn't come up for years later. That's just, if, if you're from the islands, you understand that, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And so, and yeah. people didn't understand also her place in it, why she didn't talk or act like some of the other people that were around her, but she could live there. Like the concept of only seeing one kind of African-American person or black person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that comes out in your book that's really fascinating because it's Okoye is moving through the world because she has been raised with that confidence and she knows ex exactly who she is. Mm -hmm. That's disconcerting for other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, mm -hmm. and I love that about this book because that's what it means to grow up, not just without poverty, but with, with, with family mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and security. And the, culture, culture yes, and tradition. Culture. Mm -hmm. uh, she, the uh, Dora logic, not only is it Wakanda culture for what it is, right? Uh, for, for what it's worth and, or, and there's Dora Milaje culture. Uh, she has a king, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the kids are like, what can you do for us, right? <laughs> um, and if she were to tell her and tell them initially that she's a warrior, they, you know, they'd be like, well, come, let's kick some butt. Uh, <laughs> So I, I love, I loved pitting those two cultures against each other intentionally so that young readers can see that. I think it's interesting how much, and I, I was saying this to somebody very recently, how much of science fiction and how much of comic books have taken on real world problems and real world issues. When we look at storytelling, specifically black storytelling, um, never thought I would be having multiple conversations about Tulsa while talking about Watchmen, which was a comic book. I never thought I'd be having multiple conversations about just all of the different ways that growing up trying to integrate a neighborhood uh, like Love, Lovecraft Country and Sundown Towns and things like that. Even though that was science fiction, there is African-American history in there, you know, them, which was a lot. But there's so much of our stories now being woven into science fiction. I think it's a really good time for kids, YA, especially at the YA level, who can who have an understanding, more of an understanding, to get to get these stories. So I was in my uh, late teens, um, early twenties when The Matrix came out, uh, and that was a movement. If you were a certain kind of kid. We got that. We saw oh. that movie and it was like, what? Yes. We're in the matrix. What? <laughs> and it was, a. Uh, we needed science fiction to reflect back to us, our world. We saw matrix and we understood what it was all about. Right. We, you know, you know, college days, you're like, what is this trap? Am I getting into all college kids have an existential, existential crisis about yeah. the world that they're about to enter. And for us, it was the matrix. And, um, I was starting to say that I've been saying recently that why a sci-fi is not having a moment right now. We had a few, blockbuster dystopian YA novels. And then that was it. Before we got a chance to explain or explore race and racism, and even we did get feminism, but we haven't explained um, Black American history or the histories of marginalized people through the lens of dystopian fiction. Before we even got to that, the market, you know, the publishers are like, we're done with that. <laughs> We've yeah. had enough and we move on to like realist, realistic fiction. Um, so I think, I think we're ready for speculative fiction, science fiction. 
I think we're ready for like a YA version of Lovecraft Country. So uh, it's a book that kids can return to, to put teenagers at the center of those stories and connect history to the future and to the present. All of these stories that are coming out about Wakanda are going to be canon for future comic books and other stories and things like that. And I know there's an argument about canon, like if you're so rigid with canon, you're not gonna be able to tell real stories. But I think so many of the black characters in in comic books don't get full stories. They're just there to sort of support the other characters. Like literally, if you look at Black Panther and before, really before Christopher Priest got a hold of him, Black Panther was sort of the diversity hire for the Avengers. Like he wasn't doing much. And so <laughs> the fact that we now have not just this, the movie that exploded into all these stories, but every person that has such a Ta-Nehisi Coates, Roxanne Gay, mm-hmm. um, even like Jonathan Hickman and Jason Aaron and everybody who has been writing for years, Evan Narciss, who has been writing for years. We I, I took pieces of Evan Narciss's story about T'Chaka and put it in, wove it into my story when I was talking about, you know, just Queen Ramonda and and things like that, how she got into um, Wakanda. Mm -hmm. And I think with all of this lore, um, I don't know if you were able to do this, but I tried very hard to do this. A lot of the lore that I put in my book, I tried to base on real lore, like real, like this is a Yoruba parable. This is a Ghanaian oh, wow. story. This yes, is a South right. African. Right. Um, and I see yes. your, um... Yeah. <laughs> so I tried to, I tried to mix that mm-hmm. in so that there is an element of reality. Cause you know what? I see it in other fandoms. Like I got people out here, you know, Star Trek, they can speak full Klingon and tell me all of the family history. We right. That. <laughs> right. 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 That's so, I hope, so I can't wait to see some of your Okoye in like a flashback in a future Ryan Coogler movie. <laughs> or on that'll Disney Plus. <laughs> right. That'll be great. And Okoye is getting her own series, I think, on Disney Plus. Yeah. So I think we're doing great work here. Um, and like you said, a stepping stone and just for me to play, it's, it was for me to play in the playground. I am just so happy that I got a chance to talk to you and this, I'm really, really excited about this book. I'm excited about all the stuff that's coming out and, um, being able to sort of, I don't know what book tours are looking like for you right now. Mine are very uh, virtual. <laughs> I do have a, some, uh, one more virtual and two more in person. And uh, I just to balance it out because I just miss going out into the world and I'm being careful, we're being careful and we're just slowly coming together again around books and the love of literature and just being in conversation with people, maxed and vaxxed. Awesome. Next. <laughs> well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to hit you up for some advice because this will be my first one, and I'm again low key terrified. Congratulations! <laughs> Congratulations! Welcome to the world of Wakanda. <laughs> Thank you.